Hi, good morning, DTS. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Arts Week. My name is Tim Baslin, and I'm going to introduce the week to you and our speaker today and have a few comments myself. Um, when I meet people and they find out that I'm a professor at DTS, they usually ask me what it is that I teach, and I tell them I'm in the Media Arts and Worship Department. So they assume that I'm a worship leader, and I have to confess that I'm musically challenged. And they respond, oh, so you're an artist then. And I have to confess to them that my stick figures kind of look like palm trees. <laughs> then they look at me like, well, I tried. <laughs> and after we get past that kind of awkward first beginning, I tell them that I teach broadly in the area of theology and culture. And they're often surprised by this and normally quite interested in what exactly that means. In our department, we have lots of artists. We have painters, songwriters, musicians, dancers, actors, novel writers, spoken word artists, and today you'll be hearing from one of our poets. But we also have people that don't consider themselves to be artists, uh, but they're interested in the intersection of theology and culture. We have educators, we have nurses, um, we have academics, and we even have a few pastors. We cast a rather wide net, and you can see that from a lot of our course offerings. We have classes that go to Italy to study medieval spirituality. We have classes that go to England to study some really great literature. Every January, I take a group of students to Park City, Utah to Sundance Film Festival, where we watch films. Um, every March, Dr. Kreider takes students to South by Southwest to listen to music. We have these courses because we believe that the arts are more than a pastime or a diversion or a luxury. They are part of how we experience God's revelation in the world. And they can help us be attentive to the work of God in the world. The longer I've been teaching about the intersection of theology and culture, the more I've come to believe that the art's greatest contribution to our lives is the training of an attitude, a posture of listening well. This is a posture our culture, culture desperately needs right now. The heavens declare God's glory, but how often do we stop and listen to the vast, echoless expanse? The lilies of the field hold in their fragile petals the mystery of resting from our toil, and we walk by quickly, late for our meetings. The um, Imago Dei is all around you. Look left. Look right. How can we learn to listen to the heavens and the lilies and to truly hear our neighbors next to us? Are we willing to listen to their views on racism in America? Or would we have a lot that we needed to say? Or how might we talk about that thing that God did last week in your life that broke you open in confession and weakness? Our words fail us quite often, and that's why we need something rich and strange. That's our theme this week, into something rich and strange, a different form. The arts speak in spaces where mystery or injustice have caused other forms of communication to fail. Mystery leaves the saints breathless and full of the fear of the Lord. Injustice leaves the oppressed breathless and full of the fear of humans. Art carries for us this burden of speechlessness. Stripped of expected forms of communicating, we are forced to pause, to reconsider. In doing so, we learn to listen. Art can help us develop ears to hear, and hearing, well, invites us to be transformed into something new, something we haven't known before. What a gift the arts are to us holding out the possibility for transformation, rich and strange as that may look from where we currently are. And that is why we are so, so excited for Arts Week this year, with our theme of Into Something Rich and Strange. Perhaps some of you attended the concert last night. We had like about 70 here, people here, it was, it was lovely. Thanks to the Criders for the connection and for hosting Drakeford. We have some more events coming up this week as well. We're very, very pleased to have Dr. James K. Smith with us. A lot of you are probably familiar with his books, Desiring the Kingdom, 
or who's afraid of postmodernism, or you are what you love. <clears throat> in the last month, he was also named the new editor-in-chief for Image Magazine, whose tagline is Art, Faith, Mystery. He will help us through, think through the things we practice, our rituals and liturgies, how they shape the type of people we become, and how the arts are desperately needed to re-enliven Christianity. That's Thursday and Friday. Also Thursday evening, our department will host a discussion with him from seven to nine here in Lamb Auditorium. There'll be some light hors d'oeuvres and dessert and stuff served. We also have a couple of things on Friday. Um, first, Shannon Reibenstein, who is our program director in our department, she's created a film. If you don't know Shannon, I'm so sorry. <laughs> also, you need to get to know her. She's curated this week for us, and we all owe her a great debt. Wave, Shannon. She's back there. The film she created is about 40 minutes, and it'll be shown right after chapel. Then Friday evening, our Icon Student Arts Group is offering something they're calling a gift of beauty, an evening of music, art, food, and friends. If you want to know more about this, uh, you can find Nathan Fan if you know him, or just come talk to one of us after, the, after chapel. Now, for today. The task of the artist, as John, John Updike puts it, is to give the mundane its beautiful due. I love that phrase. To give the mundane its beautiful due. To take note of and explore the deep mysteries of even those things that we take for granted, like the Imago Dei in a chair next to you. Today and tomorrow, we have a couple of mundane stories to share with you. We've invited a poet, Jason Cook, a THM student here, learning Greek and church history like many of you, to give his story its beautiful due, to invite us into his journey of learning how to listen well and how to practice love. He's joined today by his mom, Mary. Hello. That's my mom's name as well. Nice. <laughs> and his wife, Amber and his two little girls, Alexis and Emery. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to journey back in time to join a college-aged Jason as he begins to question his posture towards others. And we will feel the tug of conviction with him as he first hears the Holy Spirit calling him to listen better. Tomorrow we'll see how Jason's time at DTS has helped him develop ears to hear. And we will be invited to practice being quick to listen. And so, we begin. Everyone, please, sit back, take a deep breath, listen to something rich and strange, and continue your transformation into people who have ears to hear. standing before an audience much like this one. <laughs> Except it wasn't a Tuesday morning, it was a Friday night. <laughs> and we weren't at Dallas Theological Seminary. We were at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And we weren't gathered for a chapel service. <laughs> no, we were down at Willie's Pub in the basement of the student center for a poetry slam. <laughs> and actually, this morning, all of you are gathered today for a poetry slam. I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations to travel back with me to that time and that place 15 years ago, down in the basement of the student center at Rice University on a Friday night. But here's the thing. Typically, when someone shows up to speak at chapel, you sit quietly, <laughs> you listen, and when they're done, you politely clap your hands. <laughs> That's good, but if any of you have ever actually been to a poetry slam, you know the audience is a little more dynamic. <laughs> so, what I need from you this morning is to help me out. This is kind of a two-way thing. I need you to loosen up, 
feel free to talk back, to interact, enjoy yourself. And uh, if you do your part and I do mine, we should all have a pretty good time. Can y'all handle that? Good. Let me set the scene. It's Friday night, 7 p.m. Down in Willie's Pub, the lights are dim. You've studied all week for a big exam, but that's behind you. Now, it's time to relax and enjoy the slam. You ready? Here we go. Well, here we are. It's Friday night, and this is the only time I ever really come down here. Willie's Pub is not my thing, but tonight's a poetry slam. And that stage tonight is my pulpit. I know. I know what you're thinking. You didn't spend all week to come to a Friday night and listen to some Christian talk about Jesus. I get it. You're here for the poetry. Me too. But see, the thing is, preachers run in my family. Grandfathers, uncles. So I'm a poet and a preacher. Lucky you. (laughs) Well, here's what I know. If I don't preach a little bit, some of you may never show up at a church on a Sunday morning. And then... The only people you'll hear around campus talking about Jesus are the professors who can't believe in a God who refuses to submit to the scientific method. I take their classes too. But I'll tell you what else I figured out. You may not show up at a campus crusade Bible study, but if I come to you here, There's just something about rhythm and rhyme that grabs your ear. And maybe tomorrow you'll forget everything I had to say today. But maybe some of you won't. Who knows? Maybe my words will linger in your soul. That's all a preaching poet can hope for. So... You're here for the poetry, and I'm here for your ears. (laughs) I've just got this one problem. This dull ache in my gut, this faint tremor in my hand, this lightness in my head, this fear that when I stand on that stage, my words will fail. I've spent hours in front of a mirror rehearsing my lines and testing my gestures and trying to see myself the way that you'll see me. But now that I'm here with all of you, this ache in my gut and this tremor in my hand and this lightness in my head, and this fear that when I stand on that stage, my words will fall to the ground. And they're supposed to resound in your soul, my words, they're supposed to, but I don't know, I don't know. These nerves just won't let go. That's the reason I hum. Whenever I stop, it's like my bones are rattling, just battling whatever piece of peace remains. And that piece is 
clattering, cluttering up my thoughts and my brain is sputtering up my thoughts and my thoughts are spattering up my words and my words are stuttering up my brain until <laughs> the humming helps some, but the only thing that really works is being 30 seconds into a performance. <laughs> and I only get three minutes, and then you'll be my judges. So for now, my stomach is churning as I wait my turn because these nerves just won't let go. But wait, I bet some of you haven't been to a poetry slam before. Is this your first time? Yeah, anybody else? Okay, okay, I figured. Um, okay, don't worry, I'll explain everything to you. And trust me, your job is way easier than mine. You don't have to say anything, you just have to listen, right? So uh, this is a poetry slam. You're the audience, there's the mic. When you show up to a slam, the first person you'll see on the mic is the MC. He'll walk up to the stage and say something like, Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Bayou City Slam. We're coming to you from the campus of Rice U, way down, down in H-Town. My name is Daniel the Word Dr. Wallace and I will be your MC <laughs> for the evening. Now, check this out. The Poetry Slam is a competition invented in the 1980s to draw attention to the art of performance poetry. Our contest tonight will be judged by five members of the audience. Each poet will have three minutes to present their best original work. When they're done, the judges will score them on a scale from zero to 10. Zero meaning <laughs> that doesn't deserve to be called poetry. <laughs> and 10 meaning pfft. So if you are selected to be a judge, you should be evaluating things like performance, content, originality, so the poet will have five scores from the five judges. The high score and the low score will be dropped. The three scores in the middle will be added together. That's gonna be the score for the poet for the round. Now we'll have three rounds and the top, score, the top scoring poets for each round will move to the next one. At the end of round three, the poet who has the highest score will be the winner of our competition. You got it? Okay, now, I need five volunteers with excellent ears to be judges. Anyone, anyone, if I call you, come up to the front. Yeah, in the blue shirt, right there. Uh, hands, hands, yes, you, come up. You, right there in the blue blazer, come on up. Come on up. Uh, what, we have three, anymore? Right there in the stripes, come on up. And anybody else? Any? Come on up. All right. We've got our five judges. Now, st stand up, stand up, stand up. Turn around. Audience, behold your judges. Now, you'll use these tablets. Go ahead, take a seat. You'll use these tablets to write down your scores. Actually, go ahead, stand back up. Okay. <laughs> Put your hand over your heart, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Y'all need to loosen, you need to loosen up. Look, you have been enlisted in the service of poetry. This is supposed to be fun, right? You don't have to be experts. You just need to score each poet according to your own personal judgment, whatever moves you. 
Now, I beseech you, do not be swayed by this audience, no matter how boisterous they may or may not be. Can you do that? Now, audience, here's your task. You must do your very best to sway these judges. <laughs> Go ahead and take a seat. Now, when a poet's finished performing a piece of poetry, you can get a little bit loud, a little bit rowdy, you can stomp, cheer, stand, whatever you need to do to let the judges know. But if a poet is in the middle of a performance and they say something that just reaches into your soul and moves you, what would you do? This is how you let them know you snap. And now to kick things off, we have what I like to call the sacrificial poet. He's not here to compete. He's just here to get all of us warmed up and ready for the competition, okay? Now, this man is someone most of you already know. He is both a poet and a scholar. So in a moment, I want you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage tonight's sacrificial poet, Houston's very own granddaddy of slam, Mr. Hall Harris. <laughs> If Kelly Johnson could see air, or so they say, then I can see poetry. Across the line, across the page, flowing, pouring, extending, larger than life and more than real. Touching, feeling, connecting, grasping, clambering, expressing, living, life. In convoluted twists and unexpected turns, air flows around and over shapes, forms, airfoils, sections, and then proceeds along its way, ecstatic in the race it runs. Words proceed along the line, the page, the screen, in and outwoven, intertwined with meaning in a delicate terpsichoreal dance, adding, subtracting, accumulating content, building meaning on the page and in the mind, spirit and soul, mind and fingers typing, flying faster than the wind, metaphor creating. Myth remaking, waking to another world. Y'all give it up for the granddaddy of slam. Put your hands together for Mr. Hall Harris. Now look, I don't know about you, and I don't know who Kelly Johnson is, but anybody who can see poetry deserves mad respect. Mr. Hall Harris, thank you for your presence with us tonight, and thank you for your Turp to Korean inspiration. And uh, some of y'all might wanna look that up. But right now, I hope you're ready, ready, ready to be verbally bedazzled because this slam competition is about to go down. So the MC would say something like that. <laughs> God, I hope I'm not first. No matter how much I rehearse every time, it's the same thing. These nerves just assault me and they settle in my gut and in my bones. 
And I keep coming back. I have to. I, I keep coming back because this is my calling. And none of the other poets is talking about Jesus. I keep coming back because I want you to hear what I have to say. I, I need you to hear me, but not, not just my words. I, I want you to feel the reverberations of my soul. You know? You know what I love about listening to my favorite slam poets? They just have this way with their words and their rhythm, their rhyme of saying something that I've been feeling but haven't figured out how to express. It's like some echo of humanity inside of them just reaches out through the mic and surges through the speakers and waves and waves and waves of sound come crashing down in my soul and I'm like, yes, that. But that's the same thing that makes me nervous about these slams, it's the power in a poet's voice. You see, it's not the bad poetry that bothers me, but the good poets, the ones who have a graceful command of the language and the stage, the ones who come to vent all their lust and rage and pain, if they know their way around the mic, they get the rhythms of their sensual, angry, broken thoughts reverberating inside of me. And all of that filth takes time to purge. I didn't come to hear all that. I'm here to be heard. But for now, oh. My stomach is churning because these nerves just won't let go. I hope they don't call me first. <laughs> <sighs> okay, I'm first. <laughs> Here we go. This piece is called His Name. There's power in His name, and when I speak it, Demons tremble, mountains crumble, Satan shudders, rocks cry out, and grown men resemble babies. Ladies and gentlemen, I gladly display the radiance of Jesus, of Nazareth, the long-awaited son of David, son of God, son of man the promised seed of Abraham, the king of Israel, king of Jews, the king of kings, the king of you, the name at which all men will bend their necks, fall on their knees, their tongues, confess that Jesus Christ is king. <laughs> Indeed, he reigns above all things. Indeed, so praise him, raise him, lift him, claim him, whisper, speak, shout his name, proclaim his fame, proclaim his glory. Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord. We won't deny. We'll fly him like a kite against the winds of those who act like Jesus didn't die and rise. He is alive. Jesus died and Jesus rose and every day my heart grows fonder of the famous one. The famous one, the holy and the blameless one. He came to earth, courageous one, and spoke the truth. Outrageous son of God. He claimed to be the only one, the only son, the only way, the narrow one. He came to die, the wretched one, and then he rose, the blessed one. His name is Jesus. Let me say that one more time. His name is Jesus. God declares his name most high, and when we speak it, 
The word of God is on our tongue. His name is Jesus. He was. He is. He is to come. Y'all give it up. Y'all give it up for Mr. Jason Cook. Look, I didn't think it was Sunday, but I feel like we just went to church. Can I get a witness? <laughs> but in all seriousness, judges, go ahead and put your scores together. Audience, let the judges know how you feel. Judges, disregard the audience appeals, but go ahead. Write down your scores. Write down your scores. Write down your scores. I hope y'all are ready. What do we have? Judges. Hold up your scores. Turn them around, turn them around, turn them around. Let everybody see. Here's what we got. So check this out. We dropped the low and the high, which is good because I'm not good with decimals. So we'll add that up. Our first poet for the night has a total score of 30. That should be, that should be enough to get him through to round two. But right now, I hope you're ready Ready, ready for more rhythm and more rhyme. It's about time for us to welcome our next poet to the stage. Everybody, put your hands together for Mr. Nathan Fan. All you had to do was stay. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for another poet. I'm still wrapped up in my own anxiety. I, inside, I'm thinking, what if I had said that line a little differently or paused a little longer? Words, words, words. I love poetic words, but I wish you could tell that I love Jesus even more. Can you feel that in my words? I am called misfit, caged in flesh, in air, in time. I see in your blood that all you wanted was to be good, like Jesus, seen as good. Silly woman, the game is changed, but it's still the same thing we both long for, to be good. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for another misfit poet and his pity-seeking sadness. I don't want to hear his elegant complaints. Why? Why can't we just focus on the triumph of the gospel? Invisibly, he tails me, holding a gun to my head, finger resting dainty on the trigger, smiling slyly as the barrel imprints a circle under my unwashed hair. Dismembered and unremembered us on our gloomy rock with our neurotoxins, our, our Santa socks, and silly parrots on my shirt. I told you I'm not ready. I'm not ready for another gloomy poet and his exaggerated angst. I, I don't wanna hear what he has to say. Can't we just focus on the triumph of the gospel? A dead cat by the side of the road. <laughs> and five miles north, sealed in air conditioning. It's every product you could dare desire, except hunger. To be hungry is to love what eludes you. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to deal with another poet's pain. It's the love of Christ that eludes him. What, what you need is the gospel. That's why I'm here, the poet and the preacher. Words, words, words. I love poetic words, but I didn't come to listen. I came to be heard. Hmm. Mm-hmm. 
15 years ago, I was standing before an audience much like this one, except today, I've had 15 years to make new mistakes and to collect new burdens, to witness profound pain and to weep my own desperate tears, wishing that someone would pay attention and care. 15 years ago, I was standing before an audience much like this one, except some of you have taught me that the triumph of the gospel does not deny our present pain. That sometimes the hope of future glory sounds like groaning. Words, words, words. I still want you to fill my words. But many of you have taught me by your ears, your ears, your patient, listening ears, that sometimes I need to listen first before I need to be heard. Thank you. That was part one. <laughs> Please join us again tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord, who listens, teach us to be a people who listen. Have mercy on us. Lord, who especially hears cries for justice, teach us to hear the voices of those targeted by hate crimes this last week. Have mercy on the families of Maurice Stollard, Vicki Lee Jones, the people at First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town, Kentucky. Forgive us our continued racism and guide us to do the hard work of love. Lord, who especially hears the cries of justice? Have mercy on the families and friends of the deceased at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Forgive us our continued racism and guide us to do the hard work of love. Lord, who especially hears cries for justice, may we also clearly hear the voices of those who are afraid for their health, afraid for their security, afraid for their lives. Teach us to bring the good news that is the hard work of love. Amen.